This is another piece of Mississippi gravel heat treat. This is the largest piece that I have right now. So let's see what I can do. I'm using only natural light to see how that works. I think if there's too much light, it washes out the color. Or, you know, it, or it doesn't look right. Anyway, let's see what I can do with this. It's already been spalled a little bit, so... A couple of big flakes taken off, but... Uh, I'll still consider this a rock to point. <clears throat> because I can, yeah. 9.6 ounce popper. It's going to have some defects. I shouldn't hit it there because it'll. I might break it in half. Hold on. I still haven't figured out where is the best spot yet. To start breaking into it. To preserve the length. I really want to preserve the length on this one. Even though it's heat treated, it's still kind of rough. Yeah, I'm gonna. I need both gloves for this operation. Some of the flakes, when I'm hitting really hard, some of the flakes come, come right back into my hand. And since they're traveling at very high speeds, it could start, start a leak that would make a mess. Where do you get Mississippi gravel? From Mississippi, of course. Yeah. Some of you guys say, I live in Mississippi, but I've never seen any gravel like that. I think it's northeastern Mississippi. You probably live in southwestern Mississippi. Yeah. That's what I'm guessing. Who knows? You might live in the only place in Mississippi that doesn't have it. With my luck. Yeah. I get people all the time saying, I never heard of the stone that you are using, but people say it's right, right almost in my backyard. Yeah. That happens a lot, actually. I had one guy from Ocala, Florida ask me where to find Ocala Church. True story. I just said start digging, man. He laughed and I he emailed me again and I, I gave him a number of a guy who has Ocala Church. But they got a heat treated. Or, there's a coral, Ocala coral. I don't know. You guys in Ocala, Florida, you know, okay? Just advertise yourselves a little more so people won't ask me. Yeah. But this is not Ocala stuff. This is from Mississippi, in case you just tuned in, right? It, when I was talking about some other church. Some other nappable stuff that needs to be heat treated. This is from Mississippi. As far as I know. I'm not going to give you the exact location because... Guys will roll up with their trucks and steal it all. Before you get a chance to get out there. Yeah.
You might say, well, it doesn't make a difference if I don't get it either way. It does make a difference because some people know where that is and they don't want their little honey hole to disappear. Yeah. They don't want their stash or their secret location to be advertised. But in many cases, it, this is not a secret. You can, you can probably actually buy yards of it from a landscape company, you know? I just saw gravel around around here in Vermont. You can buy gravel for $14 a, a yard, something like that. It's not nappable, of course, but it's not that expensive, I don't think. Maybe that is expensive. I haven't looked at what is cheap gravel by the yard. I don't know what that is. All I know is if I had a a cubic yard of this for 14 bucks, it's a lot cheaper than buying it by the pound, I tell you what. Yeah. Some people say, I'm in the wrong business if I can sell rocks for the, by the pound. You know what? You are in the wrong business. Yeah. It's not maybe. Or I might be. No, you are in the wrong business. So what are you doing in the wrong business? People need rocks. Jump on the opportunity. Don't scream I'm in the wrong business and then don't do anything. Yeah, get on it. then start heat treating it learn how to heat treat other guys some of my rock seller friends are probably saying no 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 too much competition is not good cool it don't be encouraging these people to be competing ah, don't worry you got an edge on them already you know you you already know all this stuff. You already know how to heat treat, how to gather it, the best places. You got you you you've got the advantage. I know a couple guys that got really excited about selling rock and they you know they had a location where they could they could just go and pick it up for free. No problems. The landowner wanted the rocks gone. They were all happy, they advertised, they started selling it, and then they ran out. Tons of rocks, literally tons of rocks, and they ran out. So it's a finite resource. Yeah, so even if, even if you're swimming in it right now, you might not be in a few months. It's, it's that good, yeah. The market is that good, if it's good rock. Now, if you got stuff that doesn't work very well, then you might have a hard time selling it, yeah. And uh, watch out for the tax man because one of my rock selling friends told me that they, he had a big boost in his income and I think he got audited because of the boost in his income and he didn't report any of his rock income from selling rocks. Yeah, so he had to pay some back taxes. Back taxes are a royal pain. I know. How do I know? I don't know. I 
can see I'm gonna have a little bit of problems. Oh yes. I'm gonna have some flit napping difficulties called problems. Dang it. Or if I make it thick, maybe I won't have no problems. I can only hope. So you got some right there. I got all this stuff in here. Oh well. do anything let's hit it again it did do something but I don't see where it it's cracked so let's try it again there it goes that's pretty cool you, you can see right through it that air in there was a million years old and it escaped with all kinds of weird alien viruses yeah Where's the origination of that virus? I think it was from the backyard of some gooberhead breaking rocks open. Yeah. Never know. Yeah, I've had people ask me, how old do you think that water or air in those pockets are? How old are they? Well, rock is porous, so it's it's not that old. Por porous means it's got holes in it, and it the air and water drifts in and out. It drifts in and out. So it's recent. Yeah. The only thing old is the rock itself. Now, if you find sand in some of those pockets, that sand is pretty old because the sand can't get through the porous stone. So yeah, I've dumped out sand from these rocks that have some holes in it, like from the Georgia church. Sometimes there's pockets with sand in there. I dump the sand out and I say to myself, that sand is millions of years old. Dang it. And you can't sell it because no one, no one thinks it's special. That's, that's another problem. Why isn't it valuable? because the be the beach sand is millions of years old too in many cases so it's nothing special All right. okay I'm gonna I'm going to move this a little bit so I don't sabotage my future efforts in on this point by dropping it on a big flake yeah those those dropping mishaps will get you Man, you drop your stuff on the floor I got layers I got canvas and a towel on top of the this plastic base because of the droppages <clears throat> I want a lot of cushion down there because if I go whoops I don't want it to snap How many of you uh, <clears throat> spit out your coffee when I dropped it? <laughs> it's a Sunday. I don't drink coffee on Sunday. I gotta, I gotta rest up, cause tomorrow's a work day. I can't be staying up late on a Sunday. I know. Been there, done that. Well, I don't want to take both gloves off yet. But yeah, uh, I, when I was a heavy coffee drinker, I would drink coffee on Sunday too, and Sunday night. Yeah, I don't care. In fact, it didn't really interfere with my sleep. 
that much. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. It was weird. But anyway, I used to be a heavy coffee drinker. Now I don't drink any. I can't, my stomach can't handle it anymore. It gives me a really bad irritation in my stomach. Yep. Gives me a stomach ache. I don't know if I developed a sensitivity to it or what. But it's really hard to give up coffee. Yeah, really, really difficult. I sip on it from time to time and immediately my stomach goes, what the heck? What in the heck are you doing? I didn't do nothing. <laughs> I didn't do nothing. I can't help it. It's not my fault. Yeah, my brain has a pathetic little voice. Because it knows it's guilty. Yeah, it knows. Guilty. Stomach doesn't put up with anything. No. The stomach is hardcore. Old school. It don't put up with anything. I'm gonna let you know right away that you're being sneaky. Here we go. This is the biface stage. Over biface stage. 17 minutes, 35 seconds. Now comes the refinement stage of the preform. Why do I mention that? Because sometimes it's good to put this down and come back to it. Yeah. Especially if you had a hard time getting to this stage. You don't want that baggage of, oh, I spent so much time. What if I break it? You don't want that baggage, that baggage haunting you while you do the next stage. So pretty much you got to forget all your trials and tribulations up to this point and start fresh. Because it's a different mindset now that it's going to become a preform. And the mindset changes again, so one changes again once it starts to become the actual point. You start to put it in the base and the, sharpen the blade and all that. There are different mindsets that require you to be quote unquote fresh or whatever it's called. Can't have any baggage. Some researchers of artifacts We'll say, eh, stages, it's so arbitrary. It's, it's not even worth considering stages. Because it's, it's um, subjective. Yeah, what is a stage? The ones that say that, they're not nappers. Because napping creates a, a certain type of fatigue in the brain. Uh, it feels like fatigue. What happens is the brain starts to focus all of its neural activity into the hand-eye coordination thing. And uh, your other thought patterns lose energy. So you're not, you get this brain fog in the areas that are not hand-eye coordination. All right, so you're focused only on hitting the stone, making flakes, looking at the process and doing this kind of work at the expense of other work because your brain has only limited uh, capacities, right? It doesn't have unlimited capacity in all areas. It devotes energy and resources to what you're currently doing at the time. Okay. 
So flint napping requires a lot of mental energy. So if you are planning on doing anything complicated during the day, do not flint nap that day. If you have something else to do that requires a lot of energy and complicated work, that is, you know, not craft related. Like if you have to do some computer work, so maybe some writing. Yeah. Like, why haven't I written any books yet? Um, because I get brain fog in that area because I do napping a lot. So I can't just drift from napping into writing easily. And back and forth. You get brain fog for napping too. Like, you get rusty. When I say that I forget how to nap, what that really means is my brain has been focused on other areas and all the energy has been devoted to developing uh, energy in that other area of my brain. So my flint napping area of my brain is in a fog. So in other words, to make it simple, I just say I forgot how to nap. Yeah. And like I've said before, some guys don't have that problem where their brain can shift easily from one end to the other because their brains somehow devote energy or divert energy quickly or refocus quickly yeah but not everyone's like that it does affect the flit napping in many people they can't just devote themselves to various activities they've got to be zoned in and I gotta zone out and then zone back into something else some people it's no problems at all no problems it's not a problem some people got it so bad this uh, focus this brain focus in certain areas they got it so bad that the area that they're not using is in so much of a fog that it creates a zombie-like state. So they're in a zombie-like state for everything else except napping at that particular moment. And when it happens to video game players, they call it, or well, they call you a game zombie. Where all your brain is focused on the game. That's it. You're not able to do anything else. I've had to learn to jump around between napping and other things, but that means I can't do any of those things well. I do have to zone in and zone out and then zone back into something else. What helps me a lot is if I take a nap between zoning in and zoning out or zoning out and zoning in. Taking a nap helps me to zone out so that when I wake up, I can zone into something else and it doesn't take that long. That's how I usually deal with it. If I need to write something or check my emails and or uh, write a to-do list or go back over all my other stuff on my lists and cross out what I've already done. I can't do that well or well enough if I'm if I've just come off of flint napping. I don't really feel like doing it. I don't feel like checking emails after a day of napping. Yeah, that kind of thing. Because, you know, I mean, I, I do it sometimes, but you can probably tell that I do it because I'll respond to your email with something very short. Like, cool, or awesome, with a little thumbs up, or just a smiley face. Or I look down and see does Google recommend the response? I'll just hit one of the responses like thank you very much. Or I appreciate that. 
in the emails you can probably tell that I'm using a canned response or a short response. That's usually because I'm answering emails right after I'm doing my nappings or something else that was a difficult physical activity like a workout or something. I've been trying to work out lately at least a little bit. I haven't done much cardio so that that video when I was on the trail going up and down just these little slopes up and down on the trail I was getting winded just walking up and down these little slopes I said I need to do some cardio and then I start doing cardio and I get I get a little email message who's emailing me yeah if I'm doing a brisk walk or I'm, I'm doing some squats or something without weights just like burpees style activities I've done burpees yeah I don't like them but I've um, I do them for cardio I don't run that much anymore because my left knee is bugging me I have an old injury but anyway yeah we're on the subject because of the way the brain works and it affects the napping moral of a story is if you want you want to go into how these were made they were made by people who had issues with this with their brain activity so we got to think about that back in the day some people might have had trouble shifting between napping and strenuous exercises like hunting or chopping firewood and stuff like that they had to get in the zone so they had to prepare ahead of time in that case they had to prepare ahead of time for their napping activities maybe a few days in advance get everything set up their food and their shelter set up so they can clear out their area make sure everyone knows I'll be napping here don't step on chips or they go off in the solitary for a few days and do the napping so no one steps on the chips as an example so they can focus so that's one of the things that is involved in how were they made were they made in camp? Did they develop special camps just for napping and it looks like it's a hunting camp? I mean, the researchers don't know. It looks like a hunting camp because there was napping activity, but it could be just a napping camp and that's it. Do they? How do they know it's not? And to us nappers, it makes sense to have a, a napping camp where you go for a few days and zone into napping because you have a hard time doing more than one thing at the same time. So you focus only on the napping, you go in solitary, maybe with a couple other guys, they have a little napping camp. It's not related to hunting whatsoever. They're just napping. That sort of thing is part of how did they make them? That's part of your answer right there. Now, do they discuss these napping camps in the literature, in the archaeological literature? Sometimes they do. You get some, you do. I have to admit, you do have some bright archaeologists, right? And some bright anthropologists. But it usually doesn't get discussed. Usually not. But there are some that recognize that skills, some skills require intense focus. So they have a special location or time devoted or even a society or a guild or some sort of group devoted only to that skill because it requires so much focus so much energy so much brain power to accomplish some might say it's even cult like to be involved in one of these skills you have to follow a strict regimen no intoxicating substances you got to take care of your health you can't nap very well when you're feeling sick You go on long treks and pilgrimages to the quarries. Yeah. P ventures to the quarries where you find the sacred rocks can become 
similar to pilgrimages. I'm not kidding. I might say pilgrimages in a funny way, but I'm I'm being serious. Yeah. I can see where sometimes it would become cult-like with society's societal rules and everything surrounding the making of specialized stone tools. All of that relates back to what? How are they made? Yeah, there's a lot involved. It's not just the tools and the methods. It's all that background stuff, all the other environmental stuff and mental capacities stuff and moods and health. So if someone tells you they know how it was made, you have to be extremely skeptical because they're only going to tell you part of the story. And if you're ignorant about the other parts of the story, you're going to think that that's it. Yeah, that's how it was made. But you don't understand the other stuff. You don't understand the way the brain works and how it needs to be devoted specifically to certain tasks in order to accomplish them well. And you need environments that are conducive to that. You just can't always wing it. You can't always just make doo-doo with what you got and expect something really nice. Yeah. Some of these artifacts are very, very well made. <clears throat> but it's logical to assume, I think, that if it's very, very well made, it's not something that they sat down and just winged it. Oh, I got a 30 minute break now before before the hunt, you know, bef before the sun goes down. We just finished the hunt. We just exhausted ourselves, uh, you know, uh, setting up this trap and then trapping the animal and dispatching the animal and, and all that. Now I got to sit down and nap. I got 30 minutes. I can make a beautiful piece. No. It doesn't work that way with many people. It doesn't work that way with me. I would wait till the next day to do something really nice. Because, you know, if I had just, with a couple other guys, just uh, checked the bear trap and there was a bear in there and we had to dispatch it, uh, cut it apart and drag it, part of the way home I had the rest of the group come over and meet us halfway I guess uh, to butcher it down the rest of the way or whatever 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 technique that they would use to get these animals processed after that process you you want to just kind of relax and wait till the next day to do the other stuff I would think But if you didn't, let's say you didn't wait till the next day to do your napping and you had to do it no matter what, because, you know, your, your particular cultural group is always on the move, always having difficulties, always uh, demanding. The lifestyle is always demanding because of something in your environment. Maybe you're running from a group of uh, or another group, another tribe that's very aggressively expanding their territory so you've got to move a lot and fight a lot and uh, get food whenever you whenever you can sometimes you're going hungry and then at the same time you got to replace your stone tools and everything's going to be done all at once i don't think you can expect that the tools are going to look beautiful they're probably going to look pretty crude even though they might have access to excellent material so, what I'm saying is, all that other stuff is part of how they were made. And you've got to know that if you want to know how they were made. So, now you know. Now you're not ignorant of all the other stuff that could be in play when you're trying to answer the question, how was it made? 
Why did it look so cruddy? And is it because they used inferior tools? That's what a lot of people would say. Or inferior skills. It looks cruddy because bad stone, bad skills, bad tools. They don't say it looks cruddy because they didn't have time. They were always on the move. They had very skilled nappers, but those skilled nappers were, were old and they had bad eyesight. So even though they could nap beautiful stuff under optimal conditions, they didn't because of the, the problems or their age. It's not because of lack of skill or lack of tools. They might have had a beautiful tool set with all the right types of bone and antler and all that. But the points just look crude because of the time. Limited time or limited energy. They may have been not eating well. Just try to do something like this, sitting in one place on an empty stomach after not eating for three days. Just try it. I've tried it after not eating for a day. I don't feel like doing this stuff if I haven't eaten. Why did I not eat for three days? Well, I ate very little because sometimes if I'm feeling bad, I'll just stop eating because I, I ate something that I didn't agree with me. Yeah. So I'll stop eating and sometimes I'll eat very little for like three days. And I don't feel like napping during those days. Crazy. Energy is very low. Brain activity starts to become very foggy. Yeah. Hold on, I gotta close the door and change the lighting. can see that this is this is starting to uh, it's starting oh, excuse me I am burping um, this is starting to not be very and not be very good as far as lighting okay where was I talking about sleep no, talk about eating. Yeah. You gotta have a lot of things in place and taken care of, I think, to optimize your flint napping. And if you don't have those things taken care of, your napping, doesn't matter how skilled you are, your napping suffers. But the archeologist of the future says, it must be because of tools, yeah, not sufficient. Tools not sufficient, technique not sufficient. They're focused only on the tools and the techniques. Then they'll say, well, we focus on that only because it can be demonstrated in the flake pattern. Hunger is not demonstrated in the flake pattern. That's what they're thinking. Nothing could be further from the truth. Hunger is reflected in the flake patterning. Yeah. If your flaking is crap because you're hungry and tired, and maybe uh, you, you have to nap under low light conditions because you're traveling during the day, trying to escape an aggressive neighbor, it's going to look poor. The, the work's going to look poor. Okay, all right. But of course you can't, they don't tell you that. Yeah, they want to simplify it. It's okay to simplify things, but don't oversimplify. That's the danger. Oversimplification will get you into trouble. Yes, the simplest explanation is usually the best one. 
but if you oversimplify got to be careful it, because it can mess you up on the explanation oversimplification can mess you up all right i know i might oversimplify some things yes i know i am aware my explanations are not perfect and they are correctable yeah a lot of my explanations can be corrected i can be wrong or i i will accept contrary evidence and say dang it i messed up yeah i don't have anything to lose by saying i messed up that's the thing a lot of researchers they got a lot to lose because their whole paper their whole published article will be ruined if they are proven wrong so they got a lot to lose that's why some of these misconceptions and bad info lasts for decades because they don't want to look like they were wrong they make their articles or retract the article and all that spend time saying I, they were wrong they don't want to spend a lot of time saying they were wrong I can understand it but if you're in the if you're in the business of science you have to spend time correcting your errors or you're not in the business of science you're in the business of propaganda yeah or in the business of science fiction to do what to do well let's consult the book this is the preform now I'm going to start with the stem all right let's see where is my book oh dang did I leave it inside I left it did I bring it inside let me let me think about this all right let me see I had the book here yesterday left it inside now this is the dilemma I could stop the video here and then upload the second part yeah let me do that I need to look for the book because I don't want to do this without the book I'm gonna make a harden and uh, the base has got to be perfect and this you know the base width has to be perfect the stem length has to be perfect and the barbs and everything and then when I do the resharpening it's got to be perfect as well All right because it's gonna be slightly beveled all right, so stage two. I finished stage one, which was the bifacing. Stage two is the preform. This is the preform for the harden. And uh, according to me, this I'm not going according to artifacts. I don't know because I don't know what the preform for the harden looks like. It could have different forms. It could look like this. It might not look like this. It might have a fatness up here and a well-developed stem early on, or the opposite, very very thin blade and very fat down here or it could be you know evenly tapered like mine i don't know anyway this is my version of the hardened preform so we'll go on to the next stage of finishing in the next segment all righty there you go